the greatest misunderstanding people have about trans people is that it's about gender roles, because for most of us it isn't. Hey everyone, and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast, the podcast where we talk about open science, careers in and out of academia, diversity in science, scientific research, and all kinds of PhD matters. Today, we are continuing our discussion about gender identity in academia with Dr. Sophia Forsland, a research group leader at the Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. I'm your host, Alison Lewis, joined as usual by my co-host, Sandra Fendel. In our last episode, we talked to Sophia about the challenges faced by scientists who are trans, such as finding a queer inclusive lab, institute, and even a city to work in. We also talked about what it means to be a woman and all the societal expectations that go along with that. Today, we continue talking about the importance of having role models in academia and the big and small steps we can all take to create an inclusive and welcoming environment. Stay with us to hear more about that and more from Sophia Forsland. I wanted to ask something about role models because you mentioned that also that you had a hard time for a while finding role models for yourself in, in uh -huh. science also, I guess. So can you maybe say something about how, if you found role models then in the end and how and how that was important for you? Right, yes. So, um, one thing that I again realized in hindsight was how important it has always been for me to uh, find uh, other women in science to look up to. It was confusing to me why that was the case, because I um, didn't realize I could be one uh, myself, just realized that these were the people I felt kinship with and felt inspired by, uh, which ended up making me essentially a very enthusiastic feminist ally. <laughs> and um, I don't know, uh, I was trying when I was going for postdocs, I set myself the reason for that. I should seek out Idea Dear Lab uh, for a, a female uh, a group leader. In the end, I didn't. I worked out fine anyway. Like I was Checking with alumni from the lab, this is a tolerant environment, this is a place where conflicts are handled well, and uh, actually my postdoc lab was very inspiring in the sense that it really didn't matter at all who you were uh, outside of work. What mattered was that you were delivering an extremely professional environment, and I, I feel that this is one of the major things that I learned from my, my mentor back then. But that didn't really help me in um, finding queer and trans role models. Uh, I use queer as an umbrella term here. Uh, in, in my case, I happen to be bisexual and transgender, but I use it really just to refer to anyone who is considered controversial for uh, who they are in a gender sense, or who they love in a gender sense, or the mix of that. And in a way, I feel that even if I had been straight, as a trans woman, I would be queer because people would, some people would always look at either me or my lovers as being other than straight, depending on whether they recognize me or not. So I found eventually some more trans role models. The first really important case was a group leader in, in uh, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, named Teresa Samboma. She's a structural biologist who I came across by, by random chance and then as I emailed her and asked like, do you have any advice for trying to come out when you're trying to uh, move into a tenure position? Um, it turned out she was going to be at EMBO uh, the week after her conference. I got to meet her and this was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, this maybe this could be me 10 years from now. It was, I realized for the first time what 
like in some regard having like meeting like a big sister could be like um i mean i do have big sisters but that but in, in in this particular sense was extremely inspiring for me and i keep returning to that as something that strengthened me and then most other people that I know uh, for me in that regard are junior in science. There are a few other trans PIs I know, some uh, at sort of adjacent field. There's a very good statistician in Australia, for example, named Daniel Navarro. Uh, and there are a number of PhD students. Actually, I've encountered, I've gotten closer to these people a lot during the pandemic now because I spend a lot of time on Twitter and we end up sort of sharing experiences there but uh i do feel that this is very new to me to have those role models and it's strengthening me being able to see myself as someone who is possible to describe within the narrative of the space that i'm occupying because in a way that's what was otherwise lacking and what i think is lacking for anyone who is not normative. I mean, this applies for anyone who stands out in their field, whether uh, because of their ethnic background or, I mean, as women are in a field which is male dominated, which I think bioinformatics used to be. It's slowly moving out of it. So this is crucial to me, really. I, I can't uh, underscore it enough. And that is one of the reasons also why I am taking every chance I can to try to be as visible as I can. Because in one hand, I see myself reflected in the eyes of others. That might be useful to them. And it also helps me sort of validate myself in some regard as well, I, I guess. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very important. I find it interesting, all of the part, all of the relationships you've built with other trans scientists, mm -hmm. because I mean, in my personal life or my professional life, I haven't met someone who is trans. And so I guess I wonder about visibility, like what you say, putting yourself out there and being visible and perhaps existing as a, as perhaps now you are the role model for younger scientists, like maybe there's a lot more people who I encounter and they're not visible to me. And it makes me, I guess, reflect on maybe my own interactions and whether, you know, I'm an ally. And I guess, what does it mean to be a good ally in a professional sense for, for trans people in science? I mean, the first and most important thing is to accept that we are who we say we are and everything else in a way follows from that there is uh, i mean everything like not misgendering someone follows from treating a person as the gender and the sex that they say that they are this becomes particularly challenging for for non-binary people of course because we don't have a lot of good scripts for how to handle that is another reason I feel privileged actually to find myself, to my surprise, uh, being a binary trans woman. So in a way, like, you know, you try to step down in a pool or something, you expect to sort of find that, okay, it doesn't go any deeper or it gets uncomfortable from here. And I was just stepping into womanhood and realizing that, okay, this still feels okay, this still feels okay, okay, there's no point which I'm uncomfortable with womanhood the way I was with manhood. So it's not the way I've always told myself that I'm just uncomfortable being genders in the first place, but I'm actually just uncomfortable being male. So but accepting who we say we are from that, these other things follow. Uh, speaking up when someone doesn't do that, uh, perhaps then listening. I mean, if, if you encounter bigotry, I would say speak up. And if then you get feedback that at that particular point you shouldn't, then listen to that. But uh, in the default mode, I would hope, or I would be thankful, grateful, um, happy if, if people do speak up. In science and STEM specifically, one thing to perhaps recognize is that there is this somewhat more inflamed debate in recent years about the validity and reality of uh, trans identity, trans modality, in part because we've happened to become the uh, 
sort of wedge issue in the culture wars where uh, once conservatives realize they can no longer win win votes by being openly racist or openly anti-gay, they become openly uh, anti-trans instead because that's seen as sort of acceptable. And that's led to sort of a lot of discussions about like, well, um, are, are trans people just deluded or trans people sick? Uh, is this a pathology? Is it... Are we legitimate in saying in 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 uh, seeing ourselves as we see ourselves? And uh, the thing to remember there is that this is not just an idle um, scientific curiosity for the people who live inside it. Just as sort of a debate around uh, like racism isn't just an idle matter of curiosity for someone who is living in uh, a society where this impacts their lives every day. For me as a biologist, this becomes important because there is then additionally a lot of debate about what is, how should we understand uh, sex properties of bodies uh, in evolutionary senses, in clinical senses, and as far as I'm concerned, sex is set of multiple barriers multiple variables falling on, on interesting continua where we draw a line similar to how we draw a line around bacterial species, which is in large extent something that's pragmatically chosen depending on what need we have for that classification, which is uh, why I disagree with, for example, models where you see, well, female sex is sex which produces large gametes and male sex is sex which produces small gametes. I would say that's reproductive sex, but reproductive sex is not the be-all and all of biological sex, and biological sex is not the be-all and all of sex. As the term is used in our understanding of ourselves and the world, uh, and I feel that this is particularly important perhaps in STEM, that to me, for example, I claim that, well, your, your gender might be female, but your sex is male. What Perhaps cis people would not realize is that to me that causes me to essentially shut down emotionally and go into panic mode, like defense mode, because the way, if I am to understand what it means that I am trans, it means that I can only see myself as a real person if I see myself as grouped with, uh, with women rather than with men. And I feel this is not something which necessarily characterizes only trans people. I think this is true for cis people as well, though I cannot prove it. It's just that exactly as with a bone being broken, is not something that you... I mean, you sense if a bone is broken, but you don't sense if a bone is not broken, because then it's just functioning. I really believe that this is not a gender identity. That's not something that just trans people have. It's something that is simply functional and in the background and cis people uh, and you sense it when, when there's something wrong with it. I realize this is not something that everyone agrees with me on and it's not something that everyone has to agree with me on. But these are topics and issues which, when they are debated, aren't a matter where I can be unaffected. And this sort of makes... This sort of comes up more often than not in cases where the political aspects of whether trans modality is recognized or not are salient. So they come up in spaces where we are allies, spaces where we don't need to be allies or spaces where this doesn't come up. So I'm not sure if these are helpful answers, but I mean, just be aware that it's important to someone who is trans in the way that I am trans to at least, if not recognizing me as what I say I am, then at least recognize that it is important to me to be recognized as what I say I am. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make sure that I am not going into a state of acute distress and removing myself from the situation as soon as I can, then at least treat me as though I, I, I am. I can't force anyone to do that. I don't have any right to force anyone to do anything. But if you want me to be included, that's what I would what I would ask for. And I feel that everything else is sort of following from that. So 
it sounds like you're saying, you know, at a minimum, you don't need to basically understand someone's whole identity and existence, but you should respect that identity and existence in the way you would expect to be respected. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yes, I think all the important things follow from that. And I suppose as you, as like a relationship is built, people may understand more where where you're coming from. What I wanted to know more about is you said that you didn't start living openly until you started applying as a group leader. And I guess I'm wondering, before that time when you were not feeling, you know, you mentioned, I, I didn't see living as a woman as an option. And I'm wondering, could people have done something different? Could your colleagues have behaved differently to already create an inclusive environment where that would have been easier for you to see? Can I add something quickly to the question? Because it just fits, because I had the same question and I was wondering because you said that you had a very good experience in your postdoc lab, right? But you were transitioning afterwards. So why, like, how is that related? Or yeah, maybe also in context what Ellie just said. Yes. So even though my postdoc lab was very welcoming, I didn't know beforehand that it would have been. And I feel that in some regards, I wasn't really making use of the environment being welcoming in the way that I could have, because I simply couldn't assume that it should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, this relates to the whole area of invisibility, which is something that's relevant for some marginalized identities uh, more than others. Being out as a binary trans woman, I am visible in a way which is different than the way my existence as sort of a non-binary person was. Uh, and I feel that, like, just as I have met very few trans people in science, I have also met very few people with non-heterosexual orientations in science in the sense of being out as such. But I feel I probably met a lot of queer people in science without realizing it. It might even have been not that they're not out, but that it isn't visible and it doesn't come up. So in regards to your questions, how can one create a welcoming environment? Part of that is perhaps to strongly uh, accentuate that there aren't necessarily expectations. I mean, this goes in a way for my family as well like my parents are fine with with who I am and I think they would have been before but I had no way of knowing that because we never talked about this so I couldn't be sure that they wouldn't react like I expected people to react based on how a lot of people in the world react and I think using inclusive language like so talking not like Oh, well, uh, will your husband come too? Do you have a husband? Like, well, do you have partners? Would they want to come too? Uh, like, just as an example, like, assuming as little as possible while not being held back by that is one way in which we can create a more inclusive environment. And this goes doubly for things like differences in functionality and handicaps and uh, neurodivergence and other sort of things which aren't visible immediately with someone. And in case of sexual orientation, that's not typically visible. And in case of non-binary identities, that's not usually visible. So there are ways in which we can try to be more inclusive there, but that is not something which is easy and I think is something that always is and will be a challenge to try to be inclusive in, in ways in which we cannot necessarily predict that we have to be uh, and it's something where I think I am thankful for everyone who's trying to trying to work on it. In a way, that's one of the things that surprised me since uh, coming out more and more that I find that throughout a lot of my everyday experiences, I don't feel socially drained from just being in the world and being with other people because I feel that what they, what I sense that they expect from me is also what, uh, what they see. Like I don't have to 
deal with this constant feeling that I had before that there's something about me that these people do not understand, could not understand, and are not aware about. Like I felt that people saw a mask of a person who is different from whatever my true self would be, and um, that created this sort of constant low-level drain, which made me feel, well, I'm an introvert, I don't like being around people that much, I need all this time to recharge. And then I realized, after transitioning, that that's not actually true. I can be completely fine in many, many more spaces and contexts than I thought, just as long as I know that they see me as I am, uh, which I can as a binary person. I couldn't really do that as a non-binary person because then there wouldn't be like a mold. But what people expect of me as a woman is far more true to who I actually am. So um, that reduces a lot of stress. And it was surprising to find how much of the unhappiness I felt came from that aspect of it. I just wanted to say that this is an extremely interesting point also for myself and probably for many other people what you said about using inclusive language because for example mm -hmm. if I speak for myself I think I'm more and more aware of all of these issues and I want to use inclusive language and so on but then I maybe I'm mainly using uh, inclusive language when I'm together with people where I know that they are from a marginalized group. But as you said, there are so many points that you that you can't see or you don't know, like sexuality, for instance, or if somebody is transgender or not. You just never know. And so the idea in an ideal world, it would be good to just always use inclusive language, right? This is just something I took for myself now that you never know. Um, who is around you, especially at a workplace, for instance, where you don't know everybody so well. So I think that's a really um, good point. There's another reason to do that also, and that is to avoid, uh, I guess, tokenizing. So uh, there's a bit of burnout among visible trans people from inclusivity, which feels artificial or forced, precisely because that then becomes far more clear than it might seem like, okay, I'm, I'm asking you about your pronouns, but I'm not asking one else about their pronouns. What yeah. does that tell me about you? So it's... That's it's what I mean. Yeah. That, yeah. It's far better to do that mm -hmm. consistently. That's such a nice tip. It's so simple to just say partner. It's, it's literally all inclusive. I guess I wonder, is there something similar you think we can use for for pronouns, you know, a way to, a word to signal, like, I'm open to hearing your pronouns, or do you think that it would be really great if everyone just got in the habit of when you introduce yourself, you don't say, hey, I'm Ali, you say, hey, I'm Ali, and I use the pronouns she, her, is that, is that a habit you think would be helpful? This is super complicated, and I haven't fully come to a conclusion of what I think is the best approach. I am very much in favor of people including pronouns in the written material, uh, including their biographies, their email address, and so on. In part, this is also because I can quickly determine who is a safe person and who is not from that, mm -hmm. to some degree. I can already hear some of my trans uh, siblings snark hearing me say that, but I honestly think it is a good sorting criterion. Otherwise, I mean, one has to sort of sense the situation, I suppose, more generally. In many cases, it's likely that you can guess who someone wants to be seen as. And if they are not out, then maybe they're not ready to be out. I think the uh, just making the attempt and trying to be empathetic and making that call from situation to situation might be the least bad thing to do. This is not easy, and I wish I had a better, clearer solution for it. But at least listening when someone is indicating it, it's also the case that, of course, we try to signal who we are to others. All of us are trying to do that because we want to be understood. People have been generally either welcoming or neutral. Like, I had no negative reactions. I've almost had no reactions at all, so I don't know even if people were surprised. I guess they were, but they hide it. Are people curious about that, actually? Did people come and, and ask you questions? or Not really. 
they don't really ask me questions. I wish they would because it would actually be fun to answer more questions. Uh, this is what I wondered. Would it be fine if they did? I mean, I, I think I always wonder. It, it's none of my business. It's uh-huh. none of my business. Uh-huh. Like that's that's kind of how how I think. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and so I, I guess yeah. But you could always ask if you can ask questions, right? So that would maybe that's be a good true. starting point. It differs between people. I mean, I am an I'm a, I'm an attention seeker, and I really enjoy being the center of attention, and I enjoy oversharing. So I like asking questions most of the time, uh, but others might not. So be aware, this is something where we vary. I find the scientific community welcoming. I don't know if that applies uh, generally, and I don't know. If I had been less of an overachiever, uh, and I think honestly, my publication record is—I mean, I, I'm 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 in the top one percent of citations for my field, which uh, I'm very happy about. But I wonder if I weren't, would I have been discriminated against much more? I feel maybe mm-hmm. yes, but I don't know. I feel that just as we haven't tackled gender discrimination until a mediocre woman is recognized as much as a mediocre man, and the same would go here. I feel that it's good to have anti-discrimination policies, it's good to have uh, mandatory trainings, it's good to have uh, general disability policies in organizations. Not that I think those things are necessarily perfect, but I think they help. And this is one area where my view differs from that of many other queer people who are disillusioned about it. I feel mm-hmm. that even if it is sort of partly empty gesture, that empty gesture still helps. It helps me to feel more secure and able to work towards uh, changing things. So I think the future is going to look bright. If nothing else, we are moving towards it. I am super happy and honored to get to talk to you about this, that you approached me about this podcast, and I'll be happy to talk about things at any point in the future, and you can reach out to me at any point, and so can, so can anyone who's listening. Cool. Thank you so much. After talking to Sophia, what really struck me were the small things we can do to help create an environment of inclusivity, like the simple signaling effect of using our own pronouns in email signatures and on Twitter, since this is important not just for people who identify as transgender or non-binary, but also for cis people to demonstrate that we are aware of the issue and identify ourselves as allies. And beyond that, also to consider the way we use language in our everyday life to establish and promote inclusivity, like using partner instead of assuming boyfriend or girlfriend. One thing that I have been thinking about since talking to Sophia is perhaps how my own lack of knowledge or even ignorance might be standing in the way of me being the best ally I can be. Hearing Sophia talk, I realize that I'm probably even definitely guilty of using some terms that may not be the most sensitive or appropriate or supportive. I hope that the more we talk about these issues, the more we can know how to support each other and the times when we don't get it right to accept any corrections with grace and a willingness to learn from each other. And perhaps on the flip side, as Sophia said, to have the strength to call out bigotry when we encounter it. That's our show. Thanks for joining us and to our guest, Dr. Sophia Forsland. That's all from us. Until next time, have a good one. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. This episode was produced by Allison Lewis and Sandra Fendel. 
It was edited by Adrian Lahola Chomiak and Allison Lewis. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar, and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. The podcast series is hosted by Adrian Lahola Chomiak, Allison Lewis, Beatrice Landsbergen, Nikolai Herman, Sandra Fendel, and Srinath Ramkumar, with social media support by Nadia Pirogova. For any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.